33. We are not interested in that. It was terrible. Don't eat while you're reading this. And I just feel nothing about that. It was a journey. Really liked this. Hey guys, it's Leanne and I'm here today with my October wrap up. Okay, so if you watched my TBR video, you know that I had, um, well, officially I said I had 37 books on my TBR, but I'm pretty sure in actual fact I had 38. But anyway, how many did I get through? This many. So most, <laughs> not all, but most. So uh, let's count them together, shall we? <laughs> 33 I'm pretty sure I counted twice still not completely confident but I'm pretty sure it's over 30 and it's either 32 or 33 I was stacking them as I read them so um that being the case uh the first one that I read is in the bottom of this stack and then the last one that I read is the top of this stack so we're gonna do it in reverse order. So they will also be in the order in which I remember them best. <laughs> oh God. Um, yeah, this is bananas. So first things, oh God, this is, uh, okay, okay. No, don't fall, don't fall. So Shadow, and, no, okay, off to a great start. Sword and Citadel is the bind up of Sword of the Lictor and Citadel of the Autark, Citadel of the Autark. These are books three and four in the Book of the New Sun by Jean Wolfe. I made my fellow Bot Blaze and Bodice Rippers co-hosts read Shadow and Claw when it was my pick back in whatever month I picked it. And me and Bethany liked Shadow and Claw, the other two didn't. So then she and I went on, or decided that we would go on together to read the rest of the Book of the New Sun. And um, I told Bethany halfway through the month, I was like, okay, I don't think I can do both Sword and Citadel this month. So I can... I can do sword and <laughs> we can do citadel like next month or at some point in the future and she was like sure so i finished sword of the lictor uh i have yet to read citadel of the autark that's that's next well not next for me to read immediately but yeah anyway it's bananas uh this series is bananas this project is bananas um if you don't know anything about it we do have the live show where we chatted about the first two installments in this series. It's also just like one of those like progenitors of the genre of like science fiction, science fantasy, dying earth type of thing. And this similarly to Dune has like influenced a, a ton of authors that came after it. But it's notoriously difficult to understand, uh, even more so than Dune. They, there's a chapter guide, which um, I need to look at. <laughs> I had, didn't, I mean, I was trying to finish Sword before the end of October. So I'm gonna go back and look at the chapter guide for the chapters, I mean, for the for Sword of the Lictor. So I can make sure that I get all of the nutrients out of this. But I did scarf it down. <laughs> I can't, I don't know. I in, in terms of recommending the Book of the New Sun, I think if you're into like knit, like very detailed OG SF, then yes. And if you like me, just like to pick up books that are progenitors in the genre, just kind of as like a history lesson for the genre, then I recommend it, but it's it's weird and complicated and yeah, <laughs> it's not something you can casually pick up basically. So if you're interested, I would say look into it first and then decide if you want to pick it up. Next up, I read Vespertine by Margaret Rogerson. Yes, this is still shrink wrapped. My copy didn't arrive until like the very end of the month and because uh, the book came out on October 5th. So I put it on my October TBR thinking, well, I'll get it. Um, when it comes out but that has only arrived like the last week of October um but Scribd had the audiobook so I had already started listening to it on Scribd and I just finished listening to it finished listening to it on Scribd and didn't bother unwrapping this when it did arrive <laughs> I gave this one star so I will be selling this probably on like Tango or eBay or something because uh it was terrible I really liked Enchantment of Ravens by Margaret Rogerson which a lot of people don't or didn't and then most people seemed to like Sorcery of Thorns better and I am not one of those people I really really strongly disliked Sorcery of Thorns so I figured she's coming out with a new book well let's see which way this falls if it's tends more towards the enchantment or more towards the sorcery and this definitely tended more towards sorcery except even worse so i'm gonna say that enchantment was just a fluke and that this and sorcery are apparently more indicative of what a writing style is like and it is not for me so i found this to be horribly juvenile 
filled with the most painfully unrealistic expository dialogue and info dumping. There didn't really seem to be a plot other than just sort of like things happening and the inclusion of like moralizing life lessons and uh, I guess mental health rap. It was just so unbelievably ham-fistedly shoved in and like when it was brought up it was so so on the nose. I just I could not with this. It was not amusing. It was not entertaining. It was not it was not anything. And the world building was terrible. The characters were flat and tropey and boring. And I mean, honestly, like its biggest crime is just being so boring. Yeah, so for a book about a nun who can deal with like the dead, yeah, this was entirely lacking in atmosphere, suspense, intrigue, mystery, or really anything at all. So I do not recommend one out of five stars. Next, well, I'm gonna keep saying next up I read even though this is reverse order. Just just ignore that. So uh, next up I have The Last House on Needless Street by Catriona Ward. This is a horror thriller adult fiction book that is a, a new release as well and is blurbed by like just about every person you can think of. Joe Hill, Alex North, Stephen King on the front. And it was not what I expected. I mean, it is what I expected insofar as it is an adult like horror thriller type thing. But I don't, I mean, and I can't really tell you why it's not what I expected because that's extremely spoilery because it's a lot to do with sort of where things end up going, like what ends up being the resolution to the book. It was just absolutely not what I expected and in a very good way, not what I expected. I, as it was going along, I was like, this is well written, but I'll probably give it a three because like, I don't know. And then it went where it was going and I finished it and I was like, oh, well, that's a four for sure. Like, I don't know if I can give it five, but like, yeah, definitely four. So I can't say, yeah. I mean, well, yeah, I definitely didn't. <laughs> Stephen King's blurb, a true nerve shredder that keeps its mind-blowing secrets to the very end. That's, I guess, that's a lot of what I went into it expecting based on what Stephen King had to say about it. And I don't think that that's an accurate description of what this, the experience of reading this book is like. It's not a nerve shredder with mind-blowing secrets. I mean, I didn't expect it to go where it did, so I guess that's mind-blowing. But it's a book that's quite contemplative and very kind of uh, unhurried about where it's going. So I, I wouldn't call that a nerve shredder. And it's very, it kind of lulls you into feel, making you feel like you kind of know where this is going, which is again why it surprised me. It surprised me where it ended up going because of what how it had been blurbed and my preconceived expectations, as well as just how it's like reading the book when you're, you feel like you know where it's going. <laughs> And then it, it that's not exactly where it goes. So anyway, I'm being really vague because I do recommend it. It is a horror book. So, you know, more so than usual with um, books, I would say look up trigger warnings just because horror tends to intentionally have things that would be triggering. But yeah, I think it was really good. And it was just very unexpected, which after getting a crash course in what thrillers can be like uh, this month, this was towards the end of that month. So credit where it was due after like binging a bunch of thrillers. I was like, well, this one did not do anything that I expected. So... Um, I, well, I would recommend this book. Next up I have The X-Hex by Erin Sterling. And I deeply regret choosing this as my book of the month. I gave it one star, loathed and despised. It was not fun, it was not cute, it was not, it was, it was terrible. It was literally the worst thing ever. So, I mean, it's a, it's a rom-com about a witch who cursed her boyfriend some time ago. And that's, that's pretty much the whole thing. Or at least that's like the whole set up the whole premise. And again, I went into it not expecting this to be like my favorite book in the world or to be or like earth shattering literature, but I loved watching shows like Bewitched and I Dream of Jeannie uh, or Sabrina the Teenage Witch, things like that. So if it was going to like be that kind of vibes, then I would have been into it. But honestly, the characters were so loathsome. It, well, I mean, she in particular was loathsome and he was just like boring and the whole story was kind of boring and I kind of like, it was, it was terrible. It was, it was so terrible. Like the romance wasn't charming. The magic, the only possibly redeeming thing about it was like the the location where it's taking place the like small town but it, then I just got annoyed with that because I felt like it was like tricking me with like being charming and I was like you can't write this bad a book and then just be like but look how charming this place is and like I don't care how charming it is the rest of this is terrible you don't get away with that so um yeah do, do not recommend the X-Hex. <laughs> Next up I have, I'll do them together. I think I read, yeah, I mean, I read them back to back. The Winter's Tale by William Shakespeare and The Gap of Time by Jeanette Winterson. Winterson, yeah. Which is the Hogarth Shakespeare retelling of 
Shakespeare's The Winter's Tale. And uh, as usual, um, I had a live chat on my channel with my friend Heather, where we, we ended up actually talking about a lot of things that were not The Winter's Tale, like Hemingway and Catcher in the Rye, you know, as one does. But uh, we both felt that uh, pr most probably we would say that this is the best Hogarth we've read so far, which <laughs> isn't actually that high in praise because we've been fairly disappointed with a lot of the Hogarths. And we've sort of, through this project, diagnosed why we think that is. But of the ones that we've read, we, we think this one was one of the most successful retellings and both successful in terms of being a retelling and also successful in terms of just being a good book, which are two different and often mutually exclusive things we've found. So anyway, um, yeah, uh, Winter's Tale has never been like my favorite Shakespeare play. It's, it's, I mean, a lot of the flaws that we found in The Gap of Time were honestly just to do with how flawed we feel the source material is, because if you've never read The Winter's Tale, it's, it's very strange. And that strangeness, this author is saddled with that in, in trying to adapt it. Then again, this author chose The Winter's Tale as the one that she wanted to retell. So, I mean, that's on you, I guess. <laughs> so yeah, generally speaking, we would recommend. Next up I have The Last Final Girl by Stephen Graham Jones. This is my first Stephen Graham Jones book and Evie would like it to be my last Stephen Graham Jones book because <laughs> she doesn't want me to hate any other of his books. <laughs> I think there's a good chance that if I read any of his other books, that, I mean, no matter if I liked or disliked them, I can't imagine hating any of them the way that I hated this because, uh, yeah, I hated this book. I gave it one star. This was their Blades and Bonds for Brutus book club pick. So the live show for it where we all dressed up for Halloween is on Amanda's channel if you want to see us all decked out in our final girl finery. So that was fun. And actually we, we more, more so even than usual, had a variety of opinion on offer. We had one star, two star, three stars, and four stars among the four of us. So yeah, this is written kind of like a screenplay, but not actually like a screenplay. Like it's not actually like a script format because it's, it's kind of a running, like it's, it's written like a novel, you know, the format, but it's like a screenplay because it keeps giving you like speech cues and then like what the camera is supposedly doing as though this was a film. And then the whole, the rest of it is just constant and I am not exaggerating constant references to actual slashers. And if you don't get all those references, you literally will not know what's happening because that's all that it is, is just references and camera angles. So it's a no from me. <laughs> Next up I have uh, The Last Seance, Tales of the Supernatural by Agatha Christie. I've had this book for some time because I picked it up a few years ago um, to do a giveaway. And I, I was like, oh, I want a copy for myself too. So I got a copy for myself and then never read it. And I really liked this, which like, yay, because the first time, other than the nonfiction I read in college, the first fiction of Agatha Christie's that I ever read was The Murder on the Orient Express, and I hated it. So I was like, oh no, I love all these Agatha Christie adaptations, but like, I don't want to hate her writing. Do I hate her writing? Do I only like the adaptations? But then I really, really loved, and then there were none. And now, and then, oh yeah, I did read The Secret of Chimneys earlier this year. Yeah, earlier this year. And that was fine. I mean, I don't think it's one of her like most famous. Um, and it was, it was, I didn't hate it, it was fine. I really, really liked this. I mean, as with any short story collection, like I just can't imagine ever giving a short story collection five stars because like they're bound to not all be amazing. But overall, I mean, I did give this four stars because like for the most part, I enjoyed just about every story in here. For being an older book, I mean, I sort of go in expecting like, oh, this will be like scary for when it was written, but we're all way more advanced than that now. Um, I actually found a lot of the stories to be quite chilling and a little unsettling. So I, I absolutely recommend this. Yeah, pleasantly. I want to say pleasantly surprised because I expected or hoped to like it. I guess I'm relieved, pleasantly relieved <laughs> to have like, frankly kind of loved this. Uh, I, I could see myself rereading this in future Halloweens just like because it was like a nice one to dip into because they're all short stories so it's very digestible. Next up I have The Alienist by Caleb Carr and um I hated this. <laughs> I've been wanting to read this for so long because I really really wanted to watch the show that's on TNT I think possibly probably. I do still want to watch the show and I suspect that I will like the show. The book? The book, absolutely not. And actually like I was thinking about when I was going to wrap up how I would be able to talk about this because I was thinking that I would be talking about them in the order that I read them. So we're obviously not doing that. But um, I bring that up because I'll just skip to it. Um, I almost read them back to back, not quite. There was one in between. But um, I read The Devil in the White City by Eric Larson, which is nonfiction about um, the, was this H. Holmes? H. H. Holmes? Yeah, H. H. Holmes. Um, and this, I mean, people had always praised when they talked about uh, this book, praised it for how 
digestible and how sort of novel-like the narration of it is despite it being nonfiction. And it is. I really, really like this. I gave this four stars. And I'll properly talk about that when I get to it. Back in you go, the stack. But this book, which is fiction, felt more like it was a nonfiction book trying to just kind of tell you about the history of this era in as dry and as uninteresting a way as possible. And this is a novel. And I was just, I just couldn't help constantly comparing it in my mind to The Devil in the White City where I was like, because this, I mean, again, this is supposed to be a novel. This is supposed to be a work of fiction. So you have, you know, you can mess with history and mess with facts and tell it however suspenseful you want it. And I cannot even, I, I cannot possibly tell you how many times this book completely stops the story to just start telling you the history of like this literal, this place, this time period, the clothes, like literally like a nonfiction book you would expect would, which in which case you would forgive it because nonfiction is literally there to educate you about this place and time. This novel thinks it's its duty to educate you about this place and time. So like you feel like you're on a walking tour and the tour guide keeps stopping to tell you about the history of stuff. That just doesn't work when this, when the, it's through the perspective of your main character who is, you know, on the hunt for a serial killer. Now they're going to stop and think to themselves about the history of, of like, there's like the history of a restaurant at one point. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me right now? And I, you just get the feeling that like Caleb Carr did like a motherfucking ton of research and then was like, well, I'm just gonna put it all in there because that's not going to waste, even though you absolutely do not need it in there. I mean, to really deftly weave a portrait that is authentic of a certain place and time in history, that is not done through nonstop info dumping, encyclopedic info dumping of just like history and facts about the time and place. I was just... And then honestly, like the story itself, just it was so the pacing was just atrocious. And the the characters themselves were constantly dumping info at each other in a way that was utterly unbelievable. And then like for being hyper concerned with the history of this time and place, it was just weirdly anachronistic about certain things that just made it feel inauthentic. And just the honestly, like then when it finally came to the cli climactic moment, it wasn't that climactic. It just, oh my God, this book was such a fucking slog. I hated it so much. I gave it two stars, I think, because like so much effort, you know, went into like, I guess, researching the time and place. And then that's, I guess that's cool. But uh, as a story, no. And the characters were just so wooden. They did not feel like people. So it was really hard to just feel invested in this at all. Which is why I do think that I will like the show because the show is unlikely to keep stopping to narrate at you about the history of a place. And also the actors will breathe life into these characters, these characters who are utterly lifeless in the book. And I'm not talking about the corpses. Uh, next up I have, which was in between me reading The Devil in the White City and The Alienist was One by One by Ruth Ware, which I believe is intentionally supposed to be sort of taking its cues from And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie, because Ruth Ware also took her cues from a different book, different classic book for another thriller that I read also in October. Anyway, uh, One by One is a clo isolated closed circle mystery that takes place in a chalet where they are, uh, so it's not an island like and then there were none. I, I think it's like a Christmas or New Year's holiday and they're snowed in slash as, well, they're snowed in. <laughs> then they start dying and someone is killing them. I really enjoyed this. I really did. I think it was fairly easy to guess who was going to be, the who was behind everything. That said, I didn't take away from my enjoyment of it. There were some things about the ending that I thought were like a little off. So like, I didn't like this one as much as I liked the other Ruth Ware book that I read this month, but it definitely kept my interest and I thought it was pretty well done. And again, even though I, I was fairly certain I knew who had done it, I think it was written in a way that was still very suspenseful and compelling, even if you kind of know who's doing it. So I would, I would for sure recommend. Like it's not my favorite thriller that I read in October, but it was, it was solid. So next up I have The Devil in the White City by Eric Larson. And as I already said, I really, really, really liked this. Um, it's worth the hype. And it is very well done in terms of making history, a uh, nonfiction book, uh, very sort of compelling and novel-like to read. Breathing a lot of life into it and a lot of ambiance and suspense. And while well, still, you know, just kind of telling you the facts about the history, uh, the historical time period. And he's doing a lot to also sort of really juxtapose everything that we know and everything about the sort of like intentions and mindset behind the building of the World's Fair and the mindset of the people participating in it and attending it and like all of that going on with also the murdering, <laughs> the serial killing and how there's a lot of times where sort of the, the mindset behind each weirdly, I don't know, 
like it's not like a complete direct parallel but there are some weird parallels between the two and just the fact of them happening simultaneously so anyway it's just very well done and i you know there's a lot of interesting things about the like details because like we just sort of generally know about the world's fair but like there's a lot of things that you sort of after the fact kind of like the eiffel tower you know we just all, we know about it and like yeah that's paris but like before that existed you know when people would talk about something like that or have doubts about something like that so similarly with the world's fair where certain ideas that are sort of almost commonplace for us now came about during that time or would have been people would have been skeptical about them and yeah and then obviously i mean the murdering is uh it's interesting to read about you know it's it's horrific but it is fascinating so i definitely i continue the recommending of this which uh, yeah people aren't wrong this is good next up i have horrid by katrina lino which is a ya horror book and it was pretty good i think the best thing about it is that it didn't like the whole thing was fairly cookie cutter i guess like nothing very much surprised me along the way but where it ends that did surprise me a little bit and not so much surprised me in terms of like the story is surprising. It surprises me the choice that Katrina Lino made, given this is YA horror. When I got to the end, I was like, oh, she did that. <laughs> so I kind of gained a few points from me for that. Because I thought ultimately like what was going on and what the answer to the sort of what is going on wasn't very good and didn't make a ton of sense. And it wasn't that compelling. And I didn't really care about the main character that much. I did really like the the setting, the little town that they moved to. Because yeah, I didn't say what this is about at all. This young woman with her mother moved to the small town where her mother actually grew up because they're her father the mom's husband is dead so you know money is tight so she's basically moving back to her ancestral family home and there is spooky haunty mysterious sinister things that happen and yeah so like i said the the what's going on wasn't that interesting and the who's sort of the answer to that isn't that interesting it's again more like sort of where she chooses to end this that i was like oh well wasn't expecting that or like i wasn't expecting that from you for this book so it got some points from me for that but i think i I gave this three stars because it was like it wasn't bad but it was like eh, eh. next up i have the night circus by aaron morgenstern which was one of two patron buddy reads in october because we're just like doing a whole lot this month or we did a whole lot this month so many of course the month in which i have over 30 books on my tbr i have two patron buddy reads anyway people have been talking about the night circus for forever so i've been wanting to read the night circus for forever and being a lover of purple prose and lush atmosphere etc etc i thought this would be a favorite i thought maybe it wouldn't stack up against something like the name of the wind or strange the dreamer i didn't really expect it to that's a lot of pressure for any book but it did not it did not live up i thought the writing was the best part of it but for being the best part of it it wasn't actually that good like people make such a big deal about the night circus being just so lushly atmospheric where you just want to be at the night circus and it's just amazing and just about the only thing about it that's compelling at all is how cool the night circus is because story who is she we're not interested in that characters i guess we'll have some people going along through the night circus because we may as well but i mean yeah it's really just the night circus that you're here for and it's pretty cool but not the writing about it isn't it just isn't that amazing it honestly isn't like the concept of the circus is kind of cool so hanging out you know mentally in the night circus for a minute is kind of cool but not not that cool it's not that great and the like both in concept it's not that great it's not like everything about the night circus is just like mind-bogglingly amazing and then the prose itself in like the beauty and poetry of the description isn't that great either like it's it's good like it's fairly atmospheric but when that's all it has to offer is being atmospheric and then the atmosphericness of it just isn't that mind-boggling. I, I don't get the big deal about this. It's pretty lackluster in my opinion. Next up I have Small Spaces by Catherine Arden. I was super disappointed with this. Catherine Arden wrote The Bear and the Nightingale and the Winter Night Trilogy and then this charming or this charming looking little middle grade book with a scarecrow on it and like it would you know, it's very, it seems like it's going to be very sort of a la The Goosebumps, um, but by Catherine Arden. And her writing is so lush and evocative in the Winter Night Trilogy. So I expected it to be, you know, on a middle grade level, but to bring that atmosphericness to a creepy middle grade story. And I just, I, it was so boring and kind of stupid. And the logic of the mysterious spooky thing that's going on was flimsy at best. So like, it's, it's not a situation where I feel like it's too childish because it's middle grade. So that'd be an unfair thing to think. I think it was just really 
dull. Like, I can't picture myself liking this when I was the age where this was written for either. I just, this is a big old letdown. So I know a lot of people like it, but uh, nope. Next up I have Home Before Dark by Riley Sager and I hated this. I think I might have given it two stars. Maybe I gave it one star. I don't know but I thought this was stupid as fuck and the ending of it really pissed me off and the whole time while I was reading it I was like this is not suspenseful. This is not interesting. This is not mysterious. I am not afraid or curious. This is stupid and and then I was like maybe it'll save itself with the end but the end was even stupider. So I absolutely do not recommend this and I don't think I will be reading any more from Riley Sager because if this is a, supposedly a good example of his writing, no. Next up I have the Castle of Lear which is the third book in the Chronicles of Prydain by Lloyd Alexander. It was on my list of series to finish this year and I realized when I was preparing my end of year TBRs, October, November, December, that I had three books to read in the Chronicles of Bredain and that I could accomplish this goal. Anyway, all that to say, this is the third book in that series and I, I love these books. They're just really, really charming and old school fantasy that are meant, you know, for a younger audience. So it's very much like a simple little hero's adventure quest that is heavily inspired by Welsh folklore. And it is just end to end charming. Each installment has been like a fun little story with a fun adventure with lots of magic and whimsy and very memorable quirky characters and a plucky heroine and a, a well-intentioned hero and I just I'm just really liking it. I read a lot of Lloyd Alexander when I was a kid but never the Chronicles of Prydain so I really like Lloyd Alexander's writing style. Always have so I'm, I'm finding this to be a wonderful experience and I do recommend if any of that sounds good to you. Next up I have the other Ruth Ware book I read, The Turn of the Key, and I really liked this. And I've come to discover that apparently I like all things inspired by The Turn of the Screw, but not The Turn of the Screw. Because after watching The Haunting of Bly Manor, which I loved, then I went out and read The Turn of the Screw. And I was like, uh, I get why people talk about this, but no. Loved Haunting of Bly Manor though. And this, as the title even makes it pretty evident, is inspired by Turn of the Screw. And this was so good. I really, really liked this. And this was my first Ruth Ware book. So when I finished this, I was like, oh man, if all of Ruth Ware books like are like this, sign me up for all of them. And then One by One, which was by Ruth Ware, was pretty good. It wasn't as good as this, but like it by no means made me go, oh, I guess it was a one-off. I was like, oh, this is pretty good too. So uh, The Turn of the Screw is about uh, a nanny or a, an au pair and some strangeness. <laughs> that occurs in the house with the children that she is working at with for etc. So this is a modern kind of version of that. Uh, again, very much taking its cues from the type of story that The Turn of the Screw is. And it is sort of told in a somewhat epistolary format. And it's just, oh my goodness, it's so atmospheric. I, she absolutely nails the like, the, the suspense in the moment of like really putting you in the character's place of how uneasy that character is feeling because like nothing that happens in this is all of, I mean well, there's some pretty dark things that happen but I mean in general it's not like horrendous gore or like something like really atrocious happening it's really just the author doing such an amazing job of really setting the scene and the, the the feeling of the moment where you feel the suspense of the moment even though it's nothing that intense going on if that makes sense because like able to transport you to like how you feel if you're like by yourself at home and you hear a weird noise and you don't know what it is and you're like I know this is crazy like it's fine but you're by yourself and you're like psyching yourself out about it so like she's able to put you in the headspace of a character that's going through something like that really successfully so even though you're not there in a creepy house by yourself like if you, you are totally there with the character and feeling like oh god oh god oh god so well done very good and also very good in terms of just sort of like being a retelling of the turn of the screw like i think it does it well i think it improves on it because i like this better but anyway definitely recommend turn of the key next up i have the silent patient by alex michaelides um i read the maidens in september uh the silent patient i think is his debut book and most people have always said that this is like really really good and then when the maidens came out people were saying that it wasn't nearly as good as the silent patient so when I read that, people were like, well, you should still try The Silent Patient. And I mean, I liked The Maidens a lot better than a lot of people. It wasn't like amazing. But um, so The Silent Patient is better than The Maidens, but I wouldn't say it's 
miles in a way better because I feel like it cheats in very similar ways to The Maidens. Like having read The Maidens, I was like, I feel like there's, I've only now read two books from you, but I feel like I've spotted your patterns, sir. I think it's clever for what it is and unusual for what it is, although I'm by no means an expert on thrillers. I've pretty much like almost every thriller I've read in my life, I read just this month in October. That's not true, but it it's pretty true. I feel like it's pretty good. I feel like it's like the mains and that it's very page turny. It's quite compelling. Like you, you it's propulsive. You want to know what's going to happen. You want to know what is happening. You want to know what the answer is. It does a pretty good job of sort of painting fairly vivid images of these characters. But ultimately, like, it feels hollow. Like when you do come to realize what's been going on or what the answer is to what is happening or has been happening or whatever. Similarly to them, it's not as bad as the maidens was about this, but where like the answer is surprising. And the answer is surprising because really ultimately like it's kind of hollow. Like you don't, it doesn't reframe things in a way that makes you go, wow. It re like when you think back at what happened, you're like, well, there's a reason that I didn't think that. And that's, that's kind of dumb. <laughs> Other books, you know, where you read what the answer is to something or you learn that you've been intentionally misled, you know, by the author and you're like, oh, actually that's what's been going on. And then you go back to read it. And you're like, oh, how clever. Because like now that you know it and you go back to read it, technically it could be read that way. And you know, those are the good books. But this book is the kind where like, if you were to go back and read it, you're like, well, of course, like you were very deliberately misleading the reader. Like this, this is kind of, you're kind of cheating. I think it's pretty good for what it is, but I don't think it's that good. <laughs> Next up I have the book my patrons made me suffer through, House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danielewski. I read this whole freaking thing and it was a journey. I vlogged it for my patrons so they know what my journey was like. I did also chat about it with Bethany on our podcast, Chapter 3 podcast. Bethany liked it a whole heck of a lot more than me. Bethany also likes puzzle boxes a whole heck of a lot more than me. You never heard of House of Leaves? I hadn't either. It is a strange, I want to say a strange little book, but this is by no one's standards a little book. Uh, it is a strange book and it is, it's, it's, uh, I mean basically the point of it is to like have you chasing your tail trying to track down all of the hidden meanings and all of the clues and all of the it's just like a bunch of a bunch of gimmicks and like it takes no small amount of effort to put this kind of thing together so hats off to mark z danielewski like a for effort absolutely but i just don't think this is very enjoyable as a reading experience this is not my cup of tea i don't enjoy being made to like suffer through putting pieces together when you could just tell me a story. Do you have a story to tell? Great, tell me the story. And there can be extra little things that like you could want to hunt down in a story that like bring, has an added level of enjoyment, an added extra bonus for the person who wishes to do something like that. When the entire book is that, that to read the book is to do that, is to follow up on all the clues because like that is the story, is you running from clue to clue to clue is just, it is just so absolutely not my thing. So uh, I guess I'm glad that I was forced to do this so I could like see what this is all about. Yeah, but I would not choose this for myself. And if you are like me, then I would advise you not to choose it for yourself either. But if you want to know what me and Bethany thought about it more fully, um, I'll leave the podcast links down below. Next up, I have The Monstromologist by Rick Yancey. I've had this on my shelf for quite a long time. And uh, everyone told me, or not everyone, but I heard a lot of people say, that it's just like so horrific and gory for YA and just like maybe not even for YA, just like straight up is mega gory, mega horrific. So I went in, you know, people were like, you know, don't eat while you're reading this. Don't eat right before reading this. Like it's, it's gnarly. And like, maybe I was just over prepared for it. I don't think, like, I guess for YA, like, I guess if I had, if I was like 12, I might be like, oh geez. But I mean, I don't know. I feel like people make a really big deal about it. I don't, like there's a lot of gory things that happen, I guess, but like, I don't know. I just don't think it was that off-putting. Like, I don't, I don't think it was that bad, you know? You know? But I don't know. Maybe I just have a stronger stomach. I don't know. It's hard to say about that kind of thing. Because, like, if it grosses you out, well, then... I mean, who am I to say that, what, no, it doesn't gross you out? Like, you're lying? <laughs> so, I mean, it clearly does gross people out. So, I'll pass on the warning. People get mega grossed out by this. I went in, like, armored for that, which I needn't have because I didn't find it to be that gory or that bad. I was not put off my dinner in the slightest. This is basically very much in vibe to like a Sherlock Holmesy investigation in the Victorian era, but there's, you know, or somewhere like, it's like between Sherlock Holmes and Penny Dreadful, but like where you have a young boy as the main character and he's 
working for. He's like the mentor or he's being mentored by um, the monstromologist who's got the very like Sherlock Holmesy vibe. And less Sherlock Holmes in terms of like being like a genius detective because I mean there is detectiving or whatever going on but more just in terms of being a sort of eccentric eccentric genius in that sense so like he's not a very good caretaker for the young boy who basically has to take care of both of them because like he doesn't think about you know feeding them and he's sort of really dedicated to his work says a lot of things that feel like non sequiturs and you just kind of like well he's a genius so like gotta let him be kind of how Sherlock Holmes is where you're like what is he talking about like don't ask don't worry about it have you eaten today <laughs> like that kind of vibe I found it to be pretty good like I would be there's it's actually the first in a series so like I would be interested to read the other books in the series it didn't I don't know I expected it to be like much more shocking so then I guess I was just unfairly let down by the fact that it wasn't that shocking to me I don't know how I would have felt about it if no one had pre-prepped me like that but overall I thought it was pretty good so if it sounds appealing to you a Victorian monster mystery then I recommend next up I have A Game of Thrones by George R. R. Martin because myself and Jimmy from the Fantasy Network and Alex from Alex Nieves are hosting a Song of Ice and Fire read-along and the first live show was on my channel and it was three hours and we were drinking. So um, it was quite a shindig. Uh, I cannot guarantee, in fact, I would like to guarantee the opposite, that we will never again drink for three hours for another Song of Ice and Fire read along live show. But I don't know what a month from now me is going to think about that. We'll see when we get there. Any hoosies, this is a reread for all of us. And obviously we talked about it for three hours. Obviously you can watch the replay if you're interested. Um, yeah, I mean, we love these books and we're having a great time sort of revisiting, reacquainting ourselves with the books because the show is quite fresh or was like the freshest thing in our minds. So like coming back to, to where it started, to the beginning, to the source, both the beginning of the story as well as like the fact that it's like the books and not the show and yeah i'm really glad we're doing this so i loved coming back to game of thrones and i can't wait to we can't wait to read a clash of kings next up i have my cousin rachel by daphne du maurier i already read this with mara from books like whoa and alan from the library of alexandria and we all really liked this i think for sure um me and mara felt this was our favorite du maurier that we've read so far i don't know where alan ranks it but we all enjoyed it and if you don't know what my cousin rachel is it's the story of how much i didn't really know much about it going into it but basically this young man ends up having his cousin rachel come to live with him I think that's all I knew going into it. And I knew it was a Du Maurier book, so I knew that there would be something mysterious or sinister about it. So that's fine. That's all you need to know either. And I think, yeah, Daphne Du Maurier is an amazing writer. It is extremely atmospheric. This is the first Du Maurier that I read that I didn't already know what the story was. So that might be why I enjoyed it the most. So it might be unfair, but I definitely had, did do think I enjoyed this the most. So I definitely recommend. I mean, I recommend Du Maurier because Rebecca is fantastic. Jamaica Ann is really good. And my cousin Rachel is fabulous. So if you have not checked out Daphne du Maurier's writing, I absolutely recommend it. Any of those are great to start with, but since my favorite so far has been my cousin Rachel, then why not give my cousin Rachel a go? Next up I have We Have Always Lived in the Castle by Shirley Jackson. This was the other patron buddy read. And I liked this a whole heck of a lot more than The Haunting of Hill House, which I low-key hated. I can't say that I loved this and... It was kind of one where I think I enjoyed the journey, but by the time I got to the end, I, part of the reason why that I enjoyed the journey was because I expected the destination to to exist, to, for there to be a destination. And there really isn't one. So I kind of finished it and I kind of felt like, okay, what was the point of that? <laughs> Which was a, a thing that I thought about a lot of books that I read in October. So... It was just, a, I enjoyed the journey a lot more with this one than I did on some of the others where I felt like, what's the point? I feel like it didn't really have anything that it was trying. I guess I'm also a modern reader, maybe expecting too much of like a twist or like a little zinger at the end or something to like, I don't know, a reveal. And they're really like, there were, there, okay, there is a reveal, but it's a reveal that, it, again, maybe it's just that I'm a modern reader and so many more books and shows and movies do these kinds of things that when I got to the reveal, I was like, well, yeah, that's what happened. <laughs> like, it, it didn't feel that surprising. Like, it's surprising in terms of like, yeah, technically, the book hasn't told you this yet. Technically, this is new information. But like, you, you pretty much, at least I did, and I think a lot of people, by the time that you got, you get to the book actually telling you this, you're like, no, I, I worked that one out for myself. Yeah, you're right. Thank you for confirming. <laughs> so, I mean, 
fact, I think it's pretty good. I think it's well written. I think it's very atmospheric. And I think the, the portrait of humanity that it paints is interesting. It's good. It's definitely good. And I, again, I think it's way better than The Haunting of Hill House. So as compared to that, I highly recommend. <laughs> Next up I have The Shining by Stephen King, which I did not really like. This was another one where I felt like, what was the point of that? <laughs> and it's a long ass fucking book, which like is a problem with Stephen King in general, where a lot of his books are just too long. I say having read three Stephen King books. Is it three? No, because I read two Dark Tower books. Five Stephen King books? And yeah, like, I mean, at the outset, I was fairly quickly into it and invested. And I was like, okay, I think I'm going to like this. And then when it got to be doing the thing that it does, which if you don't know what it does, I don't want to say what it does, but like the horror thing that it happens. I just, and it, when and that, and again, when that started happening, I was like, oh, that's, you know, that's kind of unsettling. And then it's just, it is, it devolves into so much of that and then kind of loses, like having any kind of story or message or actual tether to like psychological horror. It just becomes straight up wild bonkers horror. And I just feel nothing about that. Like for me to be horrified, it still has to have some kind of tether to the, a real experience, if that makes sense, to the character's real experience. And if the whole thing is just like bananas, which it, it by like, it becomes completely bananas. I just, it just becomes like horror for the sake of horror and shocks for the sake of shock value. At which point I am no longer horrified or shocked. I'm just like, uh-huh. Please tell me again how horrifying this is. Oh, more blood. Oh no. Oh, a creepy thing. Oh, heaven forbid. Like, it's just like, I feel nothing about it because like the thing that makes me feel something about something like that is my attachment to the real lived experience of a character and their, yeah. You have to take me along for that ride. And it just didn't. I, I finished it and I was just like, okay, but for why? I, I don't get it. So I guess if the point of it is just to like do a bunch of creepy, bloody, scary nonsense, it certainly does that. So I'll probably now go watch the movie and see how I feel about that. <laughs> Next up I have Ghostly Echoes by William Ritter, um, which is the third book in the Jacoby series. And I, I really, really liked the first Jacoby book. The second one was like, eh. And the third one, I think is better than the second one, but like not by a lot. Like I think the first one is like great. And the second one was like, oh, okay, that's fine. And this one was like, okay, fine. There, it's too much focused on this overarching story. And it, I think it works so much better when it felt more episodic, which it feels very episodic in the first book. And now it's too worried about sort of like this ongoing mystery and this ongoing plot threads and the characters like ongoing situation and drama. So you just kind of like get added reveals for that but it's still not resolved and now that's like the whole focus of it so like you end it with like just more I mean some new answers just more questions about this overarching thing and that's like the whole thing of it now and um so there's one more book in the series no I mean I'll read it just to wrap up that mystery but I wish it had been sort of more standalone adventures with these characters because I think that is where its strength lies so I'm a little disappointed in how it's kind of what it's turning into I still think it's pretty good but well, as good as the first one. Next up, I have Practical Magic by Alice Hoffman. Loki hated this. I did see the movie of it a few years ago and I didn't like the movie very much, but I don't, I mean, I'd only ever seen it once and it was a little while ago. So I didn't, like, I don't, I'm not super familiar with the movie. But that said, as I was reading this book, I was like, I don't, I guess I really don't remember the movie. Cause like, I don't really remember any of this happening. And, uh, and then after that, after I read the book, I watched, I didn't watch the movie, but I watched a trailer for the movie. And I was like, oh yeah, like just from the trailer. Yeah, the, the movie doesn't have uh, like most of this. <laughs> so the movie is like wildly different from, it like has, has some of the bones of the book in it, but like it's really, really different. And I can't really say that I like either very much, but they are very, very different. And I will say the movie felt like it had a plot with a point to it, even if I didn't super enjoy the journey. This was definitely a situation where I was like, what was the point of that? At all times, the book feels like it's, you know, like some, a lot of books will have a sort of like montage catch up on like a character situation or their life or the place they live. Or if it's more in the middle, then it's like a montage catch up so we can have a time jump or something like that. But this entire book at all times feels like a montage catch up. And I just kept waiting for the story to start because we're just montaging our way through the entire thing and then it's over. And I was just like, when was the story supposed to happen? Because all of that felt like you were just like broad strokes catching me up, telling me 
never showing me. And what you were telling me was just kind of like, it wasn't a story. It just wasn't a story. So yeah, d I did not like this. I guess if you're just into the vibes, then you might enjoy it. I guess that is what people enjoy about it, but yeah, I don't get it. Next up I have The Ancestor by Danielle Tristoni. And this, it was absolutely not what I expected, but I can't say, I mean, I, ha I have very, very, very mixed feelings about what this is. And I can't really explain those mixed feelings without like giving away the whole thing of what this is basically, because like, it's so this woman inherits this huge estate in Italy, which she didn't even know she was like an heiress of like someone, you know, mysteriously like comes and finds her and is like, you're actually like the last living heir. This is yours now. And she was like, what in the what? How? Who? So she goes there and, you know, there's some sinister secret about, you know, what she's inherited beyond just the mere property. And that's like the pitch for it. So, yeah, like the thing that is the sinister secret thing that she's inherited is the thing that like is revealed in the book, which is why I can't tell you without spoilers because that's like the whole thing. But I mean, it does, it's not just like, you know, the last page reveals it to you. Like it gets revealed and then quite a lot happens after the revelation, like with the thing of what the secret is. Like that becomes like really integral to the plot. Like that's what now the plot is about. So I really can't tell you <laughs> what that thing is or, or why I have extremely mixed feelings about it. Even if I tell you like what type of mixed feelings I have about it would be extremely spoilery. All I can say is it is absolutely unexpected about what this is. Like going into it, I would not have guessed that that's where that would go or that that's what the thing would be. So for that, points. But the thing that it is, I think is, I just, I mean, yeah, there's just like no way I can even like hint at how I feel about it without spoiling it. So, um, yeah. I guess I kind of sort of, I don't think it's a bad book. If you're interested in it, I would say do read it. But yeah, I'm just like, it's like I keep almost saying the thing that I feel about it. But if I tell you the thing that I feel about it, it will immediately pretty much spoil it. So anyway, um, I hope that was in any way helpful to you. <laughs> Next up, I have A Lesson in Vengeance by Victoria Lee, and I hated it. <laughs> this is a book that's been mega hyped because it's a, a new Dark Academia YA book, and I just felt like this was a bunch of window dressing. The thing that makes Dark Academia so appealing is the sort of plumbing the deeps of human psyche and having to really grapple with like complicated people being messy. And this is just so surface level characters doing things just for the sake of like the plot or for the sake of having something kind of dark happen or it does like these don't they don't act like people. And the thing about dark academia is like it's that that that's what makes it dark is the constant recognition of how extremely human what the characters do is. That's what's unsettling about dark academia. And so for them for to go through this whole thing where it's all just feels like window dressing facade pastiche with just absolutely no substance. It just was so empty and hollow and it just felt like somebody wanting to like put the dark academia label on something. So they would cram it with as much dark academia imagery as possible. But you're better off just looking at a Pinterest mood board than reading this because you might actually find some substance in one of the links on the mood board. <laughs> Do not recommend. Next up I have The Broken Girls or Just Broken Girls Know The by Lauren Oliver. I thought this was pretty good. It wasn't amazing. It is a YA thriller and the answer to the mystery is one that was unexpected but similarly to like The Silent Patient or some of the others that I read in October it's unexpected because like I don't know it's written in a way where like of course you didn't expect that if that makes sense you know like it's I feel like I, I get so much better more enjoyment out of books that like give you a fair shot at giving you the information you know so that like in theory you could have pieced this together so that when you do find it out you're like, oh my god, how did I not, like, oh, that's it. And it's surprising still because you didn't guess it. But when you look back, you're like, man, but it was like, it was like right there. How did I not see? So these books that like, they know that if they actually gave you any information, you would guess it. So they're just like, they just don't. <laughs> so that's kind of how I felt about this where I like, yeah, didn't, didn't guess it because you made sure that I wouldn't. <laughs> and then the main, the characters in it were, Better than Lesson in Vengeance, that's for sure, in terms of sort of acting like people and having an interesting, complicated, messy, dark dynamic. It was it was a little surface level, a little unbelievable, but for what it was, I thought it was pretty okay. It kept me turning the page, wanting to know 
what the thing is. So it was, I mean, between the two of them, I would definitely say this is a better book than Lesson Inventions. It just, I wouldn't say it's like a great book. It was, it was, it was pretty good. Next up I have The Broken Girls by Simone St. James. And I was pretty disappointed in this. I feel like I've heard, I'd heard Simone St. James so hyped and actually I'd heard Turn of the Key kind of poo-pooed. So I was very surprised when I actually didn't really love this. And then I absolutely loved Turn of the Key. This was another one where I just felt like when I finished it, I was like, what was the point of that? And um, there was a few reasons for that. Uh, and, uh, and one of the big ones was that this kind of is trying to tell you like mysteries across multiple timelines sort of and, and draw parallels between them. And I just didn't think that the author did a good enough job actually drawing those parallels. Like they didn't feel significant or meaningful. They felt forced and they felt clunky and they felt not even that comparable at times. So I just, I, she kept belaboring this, this mirroring of timelines thing and it felt labored. It felt like I was just like watching somebody really try to jam these things in there together and be like, see, it like parallels and shit. And I was like, yeah, kind of, I guess. Like, I see what you're doing. Like, I very much see what you're doing. And that's kind of annoying to me that like, it's not a story that just kind of organically happens. And as you're going through the story, you're like, wow. And that kind of parallels even. As opposed to this being like, and the author is now paralleling these things and I'm watching her do it. <laughs> so yeah, I, just, I don't think it was handled with enough subtlety. I don't even know if it's subtlety, but I, yeah, I just, I don't think it worked that well, or I don't think it worked as well as the author thought it did. So yeah, I ended up feeling like it was forced and I just kind of felt exhausted by it. Cause I was like, I felt like I was being beaten over the head with, with this. I didn't feel it to be all that suspenseful or intriguing or mysterious. I was, yeah. Like it wasn't, I, mean, I feel like I'm making it sound like it was atrocious and it wasn't terrible. Like overall it was like decent, but I just was like, like, I feel like this paralleling of timelines and themes was more important to the author than actually telling a suspenseful, interesting mystery. And I was just like, these themes aren't interesting enough to warrant that. Anyway, yeah, so like, it, it's fine. Uh, it's not bad, but it's not that great. Next up, I have Skullduggery Pleasant, book three, The Faceless Ones. Do panic, they're coming. I love Skullduggery Pleasant so much. It's just so fun, so charming, so quirky, so, so what it is. I love it so much. If you don't know anything about Skullduggery Pleasant, it is a middle grade series where this young girl's uncle's, dead uncle's friend is a living, breathing, skeleton who was a detective but it's sort of this like uh, unknown mysterious other world of it's like lives alongside our own so she ends up sort of like working with alongside uh skullduggery who i guess is kind of like taking on caretaking duties he's not very good at that <laughs> he's not exactly a dad but it's sort of their adventures in the nefarious like magic underbelly of ireland and skullduggery himself is so like deadpan and the main character valkyrie kane is very feisty and it's just it's just a good time so i'm looking forward to reading more of these books because there's a whole bunch i think there's like 12 in the series so just you know read one or two every halloween until i'm done only two left. Next up I have The Strange Case of the Alchemist's Daughter by Theodora Goss. And this was just not as good as I hoped it would be. This is a girl gang that is composed of like the daughters of a bunch of like male uh, heroes. Like, what do you have? You have, uh, oh yeah, they, they're Sherlock Holmes like actually showing up. The main character is um, the daughter of Dr. Jekyll and females surrounding Mr. Franken or Dr. Frankenstein. Yeah. And it's just, it was too cutesy, honestly, was my problem with it. I think I expected it to be a little darker and it felt very much like girl gang and how we're all the name dropping of Frankenstein and Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And it just felt very, it felt like, you know, BBC America, like a family rated show where like ladies in corsets being feminist and detective-y and the gimmick is that they have these names that are recognizable like Frankenstein and Jekyll and Hyde but it's very like you know what I mean and I was just like okay it's not actually a very good mystery story it's not dark and cool and suspenseful it's not doing super clever things with these like homages to the source material that they're obviously like pulling names from. It just felt very like it was all about the kind of vibe 
and the gimmick of this without actually having that good a story to back it up. So I was pretty disappointed with this. Like, I don't think it's bad. And if what I just described sounds great to you, then you'll probably love it. It's just sort of not really like what I was looking for. And the first shall be last. I read The Devouring Grey by Christine Lynn Herman. And what a terrible way to start the month because I hated this. It is a YA horror suspense supernatural type thing that's been very much compared to Stranger Things except Stranger Things is good. This book very much felt like the author had an idea for like the aesthetic of a concept and actually like no actual idea for the story or for how the like magic supernatural side of things actually would function in order to make this happen. So it's very much putting the cart before the horse where like she had in her mind kind of how this would look and kind of how the vibe of it would be and then came up with reasons as she went to kind of like have a reason to have it be the way she already decided she wanted it to be. So it just felt very stupid <laughs> and, and it didn't make any sense. The character's behavior didn't make any sense. The way the magic functioned didn't make any sense. And it was too stupid to be scary or suspenseful because like this whole thing is facing this darkness and then figuring out the rules of the darkness and then the rules don't make any kind of sense because the author clearly hasn't thought this through. So it was more frustrating than anything else. The only thing that it was the same as as frustrating was possibly boring. It was boring and frustrating. So uh, this is the beginning of a series. I don't know if it's a duology or more than that, but I'm not interested in reading any more on this because this was a doo-doo. And those are all of the books that I read in October. Let me know in the comments down below if you've read any of these books, if you plan to read these books, if you will never read these books, whatever you want to let me know. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times as well, but definitely Saturdays. So like and subscribe. Join my Patreon if you feel so inclined, and I will see you when I see you. Bye.